reading the scripture passage from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and then we will go down to verses 16 through 19. You can see in your bulletin that if you want to read along in the Pew Bible, it starts on 1459 and ends in 1462. Listen to the word of the Lord as it is read. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our days. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. And then jumping down to verse 16. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at this sound. Decay kept in, crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crops fail, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He enables me to go on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we come to the end of our sermon series on the book of Habakkuk. And I want to thank Ken Colomer last week for covering while I was uh, playing in the, as it turns out, playing in the rain Sunday morning at the golf course. Fortunately, though, it seems like I play better golf on in bad weather than I do in good weather, as my score Sunday was six strokes, no, seven strokes better than it was Saturday when it was great weather. But anyway, we looked, two weeks ago, we looked at chapter two and saw that God declared that the righteous will live by faith. As we come to the conclusion of this book, we see a great example of what living by faith entails. This third chapter is a psalm and a prayer of a vacuum. It starts with the prophet acknowledging God's fame. And that's something that we should do every time we pray. We should recognize that we are praying to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Creator of the universe. And we should be in awe of who we are worshiping. The acts of God that he will list in the following verses indeed make him stand in awe of God. He even asked God to renew those works in his day and in his time. He then closes verse 2 with a request that when God's wrath comes, that God remembers his merciful nature as well. The prophet has already resigned himself to the realization that God's wrath is coming upon his people and there's nothing he can do about it. While God's response to the uh, complainant shocked Habakkuk, it is now clear that indeed God is going to take action. It's not if, but when. Even with this realization, however, he hopes that God will remember his merciful side during the coming judgment. Then as we jump down to verse 16, 
we see that the prophet is scared to death. His heart is pounding. His lips are quivering. There's decay entering his bones, and his legs are trembling. Definitely a picture of a person who is scared out of his wits. Habakkuk is dreading the coming wrath at the hands of the Chaldeans that God had already foretold in the last part of chapter 1. And yet, he will remain at peace, knowing, as God promised in chapter 2, that those who will be tormenting God's chosen people, even though they are working as agents of God, will themselves be tormented for their own sins. When we find ourselves facing persecution, we can be like the prophet. We can rest in knowing that in the end, God's perfect will and justice will be done. As we look at the picture of Habakkuk's painting in verse 17, we see a situation where everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. No figs, no grapes, no cattle, no sheep, nothing. Every means of supporting human needs are going to be non-existent. In the past, I have said, picture being fired from your job, or if you're retired, picture you waking up one morning and realizing that your retirement account has been wiped out completely. The stock market has crashed so hard that the stock market crash of 1929 seems like it's only a dip in the market. And on top of that, there is no means of recovery available. Habakkuk realizes that when God brings his judgment against his people, things are going to be terrible. Yet, even with that worst case scenario looming, look what he says in verse 18. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Let that sink in. God has told the prophet in chapter 2, verse 4, that the righteous will live by faith. Habakkuk is saying in 3.18 that regardless of of how bad things get, he is indeed going to continue to live by faith and he will rejoice. The question we may be asking is, how is this even possible? Is Habakkuk just blowing smoke? Is he insane? I know if somebody came into my office and said, Pastor, my job just fired me. I have no money in the bank account. Um, all my friends have deserted me, whatever. But I'm crazy God anyway. My first thought is, does this person need psychological help? Not, oh, great, he's showing what Habakkuk said he's going to do. And yet, if we flip over to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in the fourth chapter of his letter to the church in Philippi says much of what Habakkuk is saying in verse 18. He declares, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 
Paul, I sometimes wonder why I like the book of Philippians when I read that verse. And yet somehow, God keeps drawing me to Philippians. It sounds like the apostle, when he says, rejoice in the Lord always, is taking his cue from our friend Habakkuk. Then, in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 4, Paul returns to his command in verse 4 by telling the church how it is possible to always rejoice. He uses his own life as an example. He declares in verse 12 that he knows what it is to be in need, and he knows what it is to have plenty. And then continues in verse 13 saying, regardless of our situation, the secret is being content, or the secret to being content is knowing that we can do all things through Christ who strength, strengthens us. Habakkuk is making the declaration that come what may, he will indeed trust that God will take care of him. The sovereign Lord, not his own ability, the sovereign Lord will be his strength. The Lord will make his feet like the feet of deer and enable him to go up on the heights. And when I hear going up on the heights, what I hear the prophet saying is, I, I'm going to go up above the fray. Things down here are going to be bad, but I'm going to go up high where I can see a clearer picture of it. The Apostle Paul, likewise, is giving testimony that during all of his hardships, God was with him to provide him the strength he needed to face them. Because of what God has done in the past, the apostle says, we can always rejoice knowing that through Christ who strengthens him, he can handle anything that comes his way. Some of you know that almost a year ago, our family's uh, lives were turned upside down a bit. It was about this time last year that Margaret was in, in sitting next to Emily and uh, William was at uh, Children's Hospital Denver and we were just at the beginning of having DFS taking custody of our two grandchildren. It's been a tough year. Tuesday, we had a hearing in Judge Snyder's courtroom, and we are beginning to see the fruits of those struggles. Judge Snyder awarded Jeff and Susan custody of Margaret. They are still working with William, but it looks like in the next two to three months, Susan and Jeff will have custody of uh, both children. God is God is faithful. Amen. Unfortunately, as we look at rejoice in the Lord always, there are some preachers who preach what are, is sometimes called a help and wealth gospel. They say, if you just believe hard enough, everything will be a bed of roses. 
shoot things. Roses have thorns, my friends. And it's funny. I have never heard one of those pastors ever preach on John 16, 33. And the reason why they will not preach on that is that Jesus Christ tells his disciples, in this world, you will have tribulation. And I've looked at the Greek. It's not you might. It is you will. If we are preaching the gospel, we will have challenges because Satan and our society as a whole does not always like what the scriptures say. <coughs> we will have tribulations. I, I was going through some of my old uh, sermons on this passage and I came across a quote by J. Vernon McGee, who many of you know as an old-time uh, preacher. And he was talking about all of these health and wealth preachers that are around. And he said a quote that I just love. God is not a glorified Santa Claus. McGee is absolutely correct. I am sure every one of us in this room has had times where we go, why me, Lord? And the reason it's why me, Lord, is those experiences are meant to build our faith. If the health and wealth gospel people were right, we would never grow in our faith. I love the fact that the Bible study group on Sunday morning is looking at the book of Job. This whole thing happens, starts with God going, hey, Satan, come here. Have you checked out my buddy Job down here? He's righteous in all ways. And the Satan responds, of course he is. You've, you've been giving him everything he wants. Let me, let me just show you what will happen if we take away some of the things that he loves so much. And 40 chap well, 39 chapters later, Job is still rejoicing God, even though he has some pretty harsh things to say about God during those 40 chapters in Job. But, once again, we will face tribulations, and I'm just going to pull out one of my favorite television pastors, one of his favorite quotes. Robert Schuller was fond of saying, tough times never last. Tough people do. Habakkuk and Paul are proving to be tough people. In a couple of weeks, this church will face a time of uncertainty. I wish I could just tell you, okay, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and X amount of time from now, you will have a new pastor who will lead this church, and things will be great. I can't give you the step-by-step -step, uh, what's going to happen. What I can tell you is that God is in control. There may be times when you will look and wonder how, the, how in the world will this ever work out? I can tell you this much. God has the answer already. This church has been serving Black Valley and the world for over 130 years. It has faced 
tough times in the past. Yet God has been faithful. I went through a list recently, and not including uh, interim pastors, I am the 31st pastor of this church. That means 30 times previously in this church's history, it was looking for a new pastor. And God provided. As the tough times come, not only in the corporate life of this church, but in each one of our individual lives, let us learn to sing always, it is well with my soul. When the tough times come, let us remember to live by faith. Rejoice in the Lord always. Trust that the Almighty is giving this congregation and yourselves feet like deer so that you will be able to go up on the heights. Amen. Amen. Amen.